Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. And for today, it is a classic, the OG writ of mandamus case. This is Marbury versus Madison from the early days of the United States Supreme Court, in which the United States Supreme Court basically gave itself the power of judicial review. In this case, there was a guy, Marbury, who was to be appointed as a justice of the peace in D.C. And the new president didn't want to give him his commission. So the court is reviewing this. Can the court be ordered to give him the commission? It had been approved. It had been nominated by a president. The Senate had confirmed him, but the new president said no, not to do it. And so can this justice of the peace get his commission? Is it required to be issued? Can the Supreme Court get involved? This is an all-time classic. Let's get started with this. At the last term on the affidavits, then read and filed with the clerk, a rule was granted in this case requiring the Secretary of State to show cause why a mandamus should not issue, delivering to him William Marbury his commission as Justice of the Peace for the County of Washington in the District of Columbia. No cause has been shown, and the present motion is for mandamus. This is really a totally beside the point issue, but what the heck. D.C. originally had multiple different counties. It, the, the Arlington was a county in D.C., uh, and Washington was a county in D.C. and a city in D.C. And there was some other ones I'm trying to remember, but there was like three or four distinct counties in Washington, D.C. This is a point. This is a point of history also when D.C. included what is part of now Virginia. So it included Arlington County, which is now part of Virginia, but was then part of D.C., included Washington County and included some other places, too. So at this point of history, they talk about Washington County as a distinct thing because at that point it was distinct. And now basically Washington and DC are the same thing. But at this point in history, DC and Washington were not the same thing. So that is a very small historical aside, but there you go. No cause has been shown for denial of this order. So the present motion is for a mandamus to order it. The Supreme Court thus has to answer these three questions. Does the applicant have a right to this commission? If he has a right and the right has been violated, do the laws of his country afford him a remedy? And if they afford him a remedy, is the mandamus to be issued from this court? So have you been injured? Is there something we can do about it? And is the thing that we can do about it, this court issuing a mandamus? So those are the three questions this court has to figure out. Marbury argues that his right originates from an act of Congress passed in 1801 concerning the District of Columbia. After dividing the district into two counties, the 11th section of this law enacts that there shall be appointed in, for each of these counties, such number of discrete persons to be justices of the peace as the President of the United States shall from time to time think expedient to continue in office for five years. It appears from the affidavits that, in compliance with this law, a commission for Marbury as Justice of the Peace for County of Washington was signed by John Adams, who was then President of the United States after which the seal of the United States was affixed, but the commission never made it out because the new president of the United States didn't want to issue it. So Adams gave him a commission. It was confirmed by the Senate, and the only thing left to do is to actually deliver the commission, but the new president of the United States didn't want to deliver the commission. In order to determine whether he's entitled to the commission, it thus becomes necessary to inquire whether he has been lawfully appointed to the office. So yeah, this, this is all political, and this is the Supreme Court's first um, intrigue into politics. And so the Supreme Court has a problem because no matter what it does, it's going to rile up one side of the aisle or the other. So the old president of the United States, Adams, gave this guy, nominated him to the Senate. The Senate has confirmed him. And so the, and, and the stamp of the Secretary of, the C, Secretary of State has been affixed. So the only thing left to do is to literally deliver him the piece of paper, to literally mail it or messenger it over. And the president of the United States, the new president of the United States, doesn't want to do that. You know, so even though he's been given a commission, even though the Senate has been voted on it, even though it has been stamped and signed, it has not actually been delivered. And the new president of the United States doesn't want to deliver it. And so no matter what the, 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 the U.S. Supreme Court does, they have a problem. Because if they say, yes, you must do it, then they rule for one political party. If they say, no, you don't have to do it, they issue for the other political party. And either way, this young Supreme Court authority is going to be undermined. So they have a massive political problem. But the Supreme Court is eminently clever. So the Supreme Court found a third option. They found a way to rule for neither side. They don't say, yes, you must issue it. And they, say, they don't say, no, you can't issue it. They come up with a third option. 
they find the act that gave them the authority to hear the case itself unconstitutional. So the Supreme Court denies themselves the authority to hear the case. But in doing so, they give themselves even more power. Because even though they say, we don't have the power to hear this case, they do it because they say the thing that gave us power was unconstitutional. And therefore, they give themselves the power to rule acts unconstitutional. So that is their clever solution. The, the act of Congress that gave us the authority is itself unconstitutional. Therefore, we deny ourselves the authority and therefore we give ourselves more authority. It is a woman, eminently clever solution to this massive political problem. And it is just so clever to see how it goes on. So let's read more. These are the clauses of the Constitution and the laws of the United States which affect these parties. The laws seem to contemplate three distinct operations. First operation, a nomination. The sole act of the president and is voluntary. So the president doesn't have to nominate. And if he does, it's his call. Second, the appointment. This is also the act of the president and is voluntary an act, though it can only be performed with advice and consent of the Senate. And third, the commission. To grant a commission to a purpose a person appointed might perhaps be deemed a duty enjoined by the Constitution. He shall commission all of officers of the United States. So there's three distinct phases. There's the nomination, there's the appointment, and there's the actual commission. And the Supreme Court is saying, well, the language says the president shall commission. So maybe this last part is not non-optional. He has the ability to make the nomination. He has the ability to make the appointment with the consent of the Senate. But maybe once that's done, the, the, the law says he shall deliver it. And so maybe that's not optional. So maybe this president can't refuse to deliver the commission because once made, it's, it's mandatory. Marbury argues that this appointment was made by the president and with advice and consent of the Senate, and is evinced by no act except the commission itself. In this case, therefore, the commission and appointment seem inseparable. It is almost impossible to show an appointment otherwise than by proving the existence of the commission, though commission is not necessarily the appointment, but conclusive evidence of it. But at what stage does it amount to conclusive evidence, the Supreme Court asks? The answer to this question seems obvious. The appointment being the sole act of the president, it must be completely evinced when it is shown everything it can do to be performed. So it is done when everything the President of the United States does has to be done. The last act of, to be done by the President is the signature of the Commission. He is then acted on advice and consent of the Senate to his own nomination. The time for deliberation has passed. He has decided. His judgment on advice and consent of the Senate concurring with his nomination has been made and the officer is appointed. This appointment is evidenced by open unequivocal act the last act being required for the person making it necessarily excludes the idea of it being, so far as it respects the appointment, an incohate and incomplete transaction. The commission being signed, the subsequent duty of the Secretary of State is prescribed by law and not to be guided by the will of the president. He is to effect the seal of the United States and he is to record it. So the, the Supreme Court is saying that some of these acts are discretionary and some of them are not. The initial nomination is discretionary. The appointment is discretionary, but once advice and consent of the Senate is given, the Secretary of State shall sign off on it. The President shall deliver the commission. So some of these acts become non-voluntary. The appointment being under the Constitution to be made by the President personally. The delivery of the deed of the appointment, if necessary to its completion, must be made by the President as well. It is not necessary that delivery should be made personally. It's never so made. But in all cases, of open letters, certain solemns certain are required by law, and these are evidences of the validity of the instrument. A formal delivery to the person is not amongst them. So the President of the United States doesn't have to like personally hand it to him, that's not required, but it has to be delivered under the authority of the President of the United States. So the President shall, according to the language of the Constitution, issue these things. So it doesn't require it to be done like by him personally, but it requires it to be done. And so the President of the United States doesn't have discretion. If the transmission of the commission be not considered as necessary to give validity, still less acceptance. The appointment is the sole act of the presence. The acceptance is the sole act of the officer and is plain sense posterior to the appointment. It is therefore decidedly the opinion of this court that when a commission has been signed by the president, the appointment is made and commission is complete when the seal of the United States has been affixed by the secretary of the United States. So the Supreme Court makes the first finding. This guy has been appointed all the steps necessary to be appointed have been done. The, the, the nomination was made. The advice and consent of the Senate was given. The old president of the United States 
has signed it and it's been sealed and all that good stuff. The only thing that's not actually happened is it's not actually been delivered. So every step basically other than delivering it has been completed. And so the only question is the delivery of the physical piece of paper, which again, the constitution suggests is non-discretionary. So here the, the Supreme Court says, yes, this guy was validly appointed. And so maybe they're about to say, oh, this guy's actually a justice of the peace and rule against the president of the United States, which would reign political problems. So are they going to do that? Let's read on. Mr. Marbury then, since his commission was signed by the president and sealed by the secretary of state, he was appointed. And the law creating the offices gave the officer a right to hold it for five years, independent of the executive. The appointment was not revocable, but vested in an officer with legal rights, which were protected by the law of this country. To withhold the commission, therefore, is an act deemed by the court not to be warranted of law, but violating an invested legal right. So you have a legal right to this. You were appointed for five years. This particular kind of appointment is not one that is discretionary by the president of the United States once it's appointed. So the president must issue your commission. So let's read on. Thus, the Supreme Court asks the second question. If they have a right and if the right has been violated, is there a remedy? Is there something this court can do about? It? So we found out that you that you have a legal right, but there is a next question. Can the court do something about it? Let's read on. It behooves us then to inquire whether there be in composition any ingredient which is exempt from legal investigation or exclude the injury party from a legal dress, redress. So is there anything that would prevent us from doing this? It follows then that the question whether legality of an act of a head of a department be examinable in a court of justice or not must always depend on the nature of an act. By the Constitution of the United States, the president is invested with certain important political powers, in the exercise of which he is to use discretion and is accountable only to the country in political character and that of his own conscience. To aid him in performance of these duties, he's authorized to appoint certain officers who by act, act in his authority and with conformity with his orders. The conclusion from this reasoning is that when heads of departments are political or confidential agents of the executive, merely to execute the will of the president, or rather to act in cases in which the executive possesses constitutional or legal discretion. Nothing can be more perfectly clear than those acts are only examinable in a political, not legal context. But where there's a specific duty assigned by law and individual rights depend upon performance, it seems equally clear that individuals who consider themselves injured have a right to resort of laws of this country as a remedy. So the Supreme Court here is hinting at the political question doctrine. There are certain things that are committed to the authority of political branches and are not legal questions. And among these might be the initial appointment and whether or not to make a nomination. So for example, President Obama, when he nominated Merrick Garland, that was political. And when he refused to nominate a head for the ATF, that was also political. President Obama had the right to make an appointment or not, and he chose those exercises. And so you can't sue for making the appointment and you can't sue for not making the appointment because those are political questions. And likewise, when the Senate was doing its thing, how it chooses to give its advice and consent is political. So no one can sue the U.S. Senate for failure to consider a nomination or how it considers a nomination. So the Senate in history has done nominations pretty much by just a simple voice vote. They've just done it and been like, yeah, whatever. No hearing, no, no deliberation. Just be like, yeah, that's fine. And if that's what the Senate wants to do, that's fine. And if they want to have more extensive hearings, they can do that too. And if they want to not have hearings at all, they can do that. And if they don't want to consider the nomination at all, that's all within the province and the Senate. So those are all political sessions. So one of those options, which they choose and how they go about it, not something you can sue over. So all those options are equally fine. So if something is politically committed, then it is up to the political branches and not our turf. So if that was the case, then we wouldn't have a question. But if there's an individual right in terms of like this individual commission being one, if there's an individual right, individual duty, then it becomes a legal question. So if we were saying, well, the president can't make that nomination or has to make different nominations, no, we're not gonna hear that question. If the question is, there is a specific legal duty owed to a specific legal person and someone is not doing that, then that's a legal question. And so this is more of a legal question. Mar you know, Marbury was in fact nominated. He was in fact confirmed. The signature and seal were in fact performed. And so maybe the only questions left are legal. You know, the, the job is to deliver it and there's nothing left politically discretionary. 
So that might be at the heart of this dichotomy and still an issue we see today as well when we're deciding whether or not things are political or rather are legal questions. So if by virtue of appointment, a person has a legal right to a commission which has been made out to him or to a copy of the commission, it is a question that can be considered by a court and a decision of this court must upon, depend upon an opinion of whether or not there is a valid appointment. So yes, if you have a legal right, that's a legal question. One of those things might be whether or not you have a valid appointment at all. But those are legal questions, not political questions. The Supreme Court thus gives the following opinion. That by signing the commission of Marbury, the President of the United States did appoint him a Justice of the Peace for the County of Washington in the District of Columbia. And the seal of the United States attached thereto by the Secretary of State is conclusive evidence of the validity of the signature and the completion of the appointment and the appointment confirmed upon him a legal right for two, for five years, and that, by having legal title of the office, he has a right to the commission, a refusal to deliver of which is a violation of the right for which the laws of this country do afford him a remedy. And thus, the Supreme Court is left with a final question. Is he entitled to this specific remedy that he asked for? So, yes, the President of the United States appointed you. Yes, the Senate confirmed you. Yes, the President of the United States signed your commission. Yes, the Secretary of State sealed your commission. It has not been delivered to you, but that's a legal question. And there is something that we can do about it because this is a legal issue, not a political issue. The Constitution seems pretty clear that the President of the United States shall do this at this point. He shall issue these commissions. It's non-discretionary. There's something that applies to you specifically and has been granted to you specifically by the President of the United States, not this president, but by a president of the United States. And so you have a legal right. The only question left is, did you ask for the right thing from the right court? Can we do this? And so how are we gonna get ourselves out of this bind? Because we don't want to issue the commission and we don't want to not do it. Because if we, either way, we're gonna frustrate one of the political parties and we're a nascent baby Supreme Court. You know, if we rule against one of the political parties as a baby, nascent Supreme Court, we're going to have a bad time. So we are concerned about our own, our own validity here. If we rule for one party or another, we're going to have a bad time. So how do we get out of this bind? How do we, how do we not, how do we decide in a way that doesn't decide for either party? How do we issue, how do we not issue the commission and also not, not issue the commission? How do we, how do we do both? How do we do neither of these things? So this is where it gets really interesting. And also where the Supreme Court basically grants itself power by denying itself power, which is such a judo move. But let's read on. It is true that the mandamus now moved for is not the performance of an act expressly enjoined by statute. It is to deliver a commission on which the subject of the acts of Congress are silent. The difference is not considered as affecting this case. It has already been stated that the applicant to that commission has a vested legal right of which the executive cannot deprive him. He's been appointed to this office for which he is not removable at the will of the executive. And so being appointed, he has the right to the commission for which the secretary has received from the president for his use. The act of Congress does not indeed order the secretary of state to send it, but it is placed in his hands for the person entitled it. And it cannot be lawfully withheld so that the law is not super clear that secretary of state has to deliver it, but it doesn't have to be because the constitution already requires it. So it says, in the Constitution, may not say it in the statute, but it says in the Constitution, you have to deliver it. So that's specific enough. This then is a plain case for mandamus, either to deliver the commission or a copy, and it only remains to be inquired, and this is where things get interesting, whether it can issue from this court. So that is, that is finally the operative issue, the one that's going to decide it. We've said you have a right. We said in the act may not be specific that the secretary has to deliver it, but you know, the constitution says it already. So yes, you have a legal right. Yes, you were validly appointed. Yes, you were commissioned. Yes, you have a right to this commission, all that stuff. So how do we get out of it? How do we get out of this dilemma that we've created for ourselves? Well, what the constitution giveth, the constitution also taketh away. So the constitution says, yes, you have a legal right, but it also says we can't issue it. So the Supreme Court denies itself the legal authority and it does it in a very, very clever way because con Congress gave the authority to the Supreme Court to do this by an act of Congress. So there's a statute specifically saying, Congress specifically saying, yes, Supreme Court, you can do this. So the Supreme Court says that statute is unconstitutional. So it denies itself the power which Congress itself gave it 
by ruling that that power was unconstitutional. So they, in one sense, deny themselves the power, but give themselves the much broader power. So they, they lose the fight and win the war. They say, we don't have the authority to decide this because the Constitution gives us the authority to decide whether or not we have the authority to decide this. So we deny ourselves the authority to, dis to decide this, but give ourselves the authority to decide whether or not we have the authority to decide. How cool is that as a remedy, man? You gotta love it. The act to establish the course of the United States authorizes the Supreme Court. Okay, so there's an act passed by Congress. And here's what the act passed by Congress says, all right? So the statute says, the Supreme Court has the authority to issue writs of mandamus in cases warranted by the principles and usages of the law to any court appointed or to any person holding authority under the United States. So there's an act of Congress that says, yes, you Supreme Court, have the authority to issue a writ of mandamus. And the Supreme Court says, no, we don't. We don't have the authority because that act is unconstitutional. The Secretary of State being a person holding authority under the offices of the United States is precisely within the letter of this description. And if this court is not authorized to issue a writ of mandamus to such officer, it must be because the law is unconstitutional. So the law specifically contemplates that, yes, we, the Supreme Court, can issue mandamuses. We can issue them to exactly this person. So if we can't do it, it's not because the statute says we can't. The statute clearly says we can. It must be because the statute itself is unconstitutional. So an act of Congress is unconstitutional. Act of Congress giving us authority is unconstitutional. We can't do it. It must be because the law is unconstitutional and therefore absolutely the Congress is incapable of conferring the authority. Congress can't do this and assigning the duties to which it purports to confer and assign. So how, so how cool is that, man? There is an act specifically of Congress that says, yes, you Supreme Court, yes, you, you have the authority to issue writs of mandamus in exactly this circumstance. You have the authority. The Supreme Court says, no, we don't, because we have the authority to decide whether or not we have the authority to decide. Yay. <laughs> I mean, you gotta love it, man. The Constitution vests the whole judicial power in the United States in one Supreme Court Okay, and now we're going to talk about the constitutional language. The Constitution vests the whole judicial power of the United States in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time order and establish. This power expressly extends to all cases arising out of the United States and consequently in some form may be exercised over in the United States because this right is by the United States Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court says all the judicial authority is within the, it was within the authority of the Supreme Court and of the inferior cases. And this is a federal case because it derives from a federal right. So this seems like it's in a wheelhouse, but in the distribution of this power, it is declared, now we go to the United States Supreme Court language, or apologies, the constitutional language, right? We already talked about the act of Congress. Now we have to talk about what, this, what the authority under the constitution says. So here's the language from the constitution. In the distrib distribution of power under the constitution, it is declared the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction in all cases involving ambassador or other public ministers and councils and those in which the state is a party. In all other cases, in all other cases, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. So yes, the federal constitution grants to the Supreme Court and other inferior courts all the judicial power, but it does so in a very particular way. It says that in certain cases, the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction is just a fancy way of saying the Supreme Court is the trial court. So they, they, are, the, they, are, they are the end and be, they're the beginning and the end of those cases. There are cases of original jurisdiction and you still see them to this day, most commonly when one state is suing another state over like a land border dispute and they still happen. And you'll see it where it says original jurisdiction. In those cases, the Supreme Court is the trial court and the court of appeals because there's nowhere left to appeal from. So they, they are the beginning and end of those cases. So those are original jurisdiction. In every other case, they only have appellate jurisdiction, which means the case cannot start in the United States Supreme Court. There are cases that must start in the United States Supreme Court and cases that must start somewhere else to which they only have appellate review. And the Supreme Court says this language is final. This is clear. Either we have original jurisdiction and, or, or appellate jurisdiction and Congress cannot modify it. They can't give us more original jurisdiction and they can't take it away. So we have original jurisdiction in these cases. We only have appellate jurisdiction in these cases. 
and the and when the United States Congress wrote this statute, they were attempting to increase our original jurisdiction by saying, yes, you, Supreme Court, can issue writs of mandamus in exactly these cases. The Supreme Court says, no, we can't do that because the Constitution of the United States is clear. We have original jurisdiction in these cases and only these cases. These are the cases where they're the trial court. Otherwise, we're not the trial court. Someone else has to be the trial court. And so we can't hear this because you tried to file it in the U.S. Supreme Court, and we can't hear that because we don't have original jurisdiction because the U.S. Supreme, because the Constitution says we don't. How cool is that, man? And we, we lack the authority to hear this case because you tried to get it directly from us, and we can't do that because we only have appellate jurisdiction. So they deny themselves authority, and in doing so, grant themselves the ability of judicial review. So super cool. It has been insisted at this case that as the original grant of jurisdiction to the Supreme Court and inferior courts is general, and the clause assigning original jurisdiction contains no negative or restricted power, the word remains the legislature. So it has been suggested to the Supreme Court that it doesn't say that it's only this and nothing more. So you could, this is, this is legal, the, the, the Congress can do this, you know, as long as those cases provide to the United States. So it's, it was suggested that, yeah, the Congress can modify this, but we're going to say, no, they can't. They can't modify it. It cannot be presumed any clause in the Constitution is intended to be without effect. And therefore, such a construction that would say that this is modifiable is inadmissible unless the words require it. So this, the Supreme Court uh, says, no, we, we like your suggestion very much that this, this language is modifiable by, by, by Congress. But no, it's not modifiable by Congress. We have original jurisdiction under these cases and exactly these cases. Nothing more, nothing less. Otherwise, we have appellate jurisdiction. Nothing more, nothing less. So you have said, ah, oh, this language is an exclusive. It could be modified. But if we did that, we'd render the entire clause basically inoperable because then Congress can just modify it because it's not exclusive. And said, so, no, 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 this and nothing more. So you've attempted to expand our jurisdiction, which is unconstitutional. And in doing so, we rule that we have the power to decide whether statutes are constitutional. How very cool. When an instrument organizing fundamentally a judicial system divides into one supreme and inferior courts as a legislature may ordain or establish, then that enumerates the powers of those courts and proceeds so far as to distribute them as defined by the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court by declaring the cases in which it shall have original jurisdiction and those other cases in which it shall have appellate jurisdiction. The plain import of the word seemed to be that one class of cases jurisdiction is original and not appellate. In other words, and in the other, it's appellate and not original. So when the Constitution granted the judicial power to the judicial branch, it did it so in a very specific way. So yes, the Constitution grants all, um, all executive power to the, the president. The Constitution grants all legislative power to the legislature. It grants all judicial power to the judicial. But even in those contexts, it defines them more specifically. So the Constitution goes on to define. So yes, all legislative power might belong to the legislature. Does that mean the House of Representatives can do anything they want? No, they can't do anything they want because it divides the power up. It divides the power up and says, for example, all bills to generate revenue must start in the House. So the Senate can't start a bill that would generate revenue because even though all the legislative power belongs to the legislative branch, it does it in a way that says certain power belongs to certain branches. Only the Senate can consider treaties. Only the Senate can consider nominations. Only the House can do this and so forth and so on. And so in the judicial context, it's the same language. Yes, all the judicial power belongs to the judicial branch. Great. But it doesn't do it in a way that's like, it does it in a bifurcated way. It says here's cases that start in the Supreme Court and here's cases that don't. And so in the same way that a bill raising revenue can't start in the Senate and the House of Representatives can't be the body that decides whether to give advice and consent to confirm a nominee, you know, in the same way that you can't do that in the legislative context, you can't say that we have a original jurisdiction because we don't. Because the Supreme because the Constitution, which is supreme to us, says we don't. So you can't modify this any more than you can modify the authority of the House and Senate respectively. In the I mean, you can always modify it by a constitutional amendment, of course, but you can't do it by simple legislation. To enable this court, then, to issue a mandamus, it must be shown to be an exercise of appellate jurisdiction or necessary to enable them to exercise the appellate jurisdiction. So if this court can issue a mandamus, it must be because we did it through appellate jurisdiction or it was necessary to enable the appellate jurisdiction, but we can't do it in original. It is an essential criteria 
of appellate jurisdiction that revises and correct proceedings and already causes institute. And it does not create the cause. So you can't create the cause in the Supreme Court. You can only decide a cause that's already created somewhere else, appellate versus original. Although, therefore, a mandamus may be directed to courts, yet to issue the writ to an officer for delivery of paper is the same as sustaining original action, therefore not belonging to original but appellate jurisdiction. So you might be able to get a writ of mandamus in original jurisdiction from the Supreme Court if it was being issued to an inferior court, because then it might be part and parcel of the necessity of the appellate jurisdiction. So maybe you get original jurisdiction in the Supreme Court if the order is being issued to an inferior court to do something or not do something as part of its supervisory jurisdiction. But this isn't in order to an inferior court where we're the Supreme Court issuing the authority to the inferior court. This is, an, this is, this is to a different branch of government. And so even though we might be able to give a writ of mandamus to an inferior court in an original sense, if it's part and parcel of the appellate, we can't do it in this context because the order is going outside. So we could only do it if through the appellate non-original jurisdiction. The authority, therefore, given to the Supreme Court by the enact establishing the judicial courts of the United States to issue this writ of mandamus to public officers appears to not be authorized by the Constitution. And it becomes necessary to inquire whether jurisdiction can be exercised, which the answer is no. Between the alternatives, there is no middle ground. The Constitution is either the supreme paramount law, unchangeable by ordinary means, or it is on a level with ordinary legislative acts, and like other acts, is alterable whenever the legislature shall please to alter it. So the Constitution is either the supreme law, or it's just a law. If it's a law, this, the Congress can modify it whenever it wants. If it's the supreme law, not so much. Ordinary means will not do. So there is really no middle ground. Either Congress can modify it whenever it wants or not. And, you know, if, if, if they can modify it anytime we want, then kind of not doesn't really exist. So now you can't just amend it whenever you feel like it. There's a special process for that. So the ordinary means are not going to do. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is, which is a quote that is so famous. It is now, it, it now carved into stone, quite literally, uh, with gold inlay in the United States Supreme Court building. So that phrase is so famous that yeah, they, they literally carved it into stone. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret the rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the court must decide on the operation of each. If then the courts are to regard the constitution, the constitution is superior to any ordinary act of the legislature, then the constitution and not the ordinary act must govern the law which applies. So constitution beats statute. That's what that says. Constitution beats statute. So if the conflict, constitution wins. Thus, the particular phraseology of the Constitution of the United States confirms and strengthens the principle, supposed to be essential to all written Constitution, that a law repugnant to the Constitution is void, and the courts and other departments are bound by that instrument. The rule to the contrary thus must be discharged. Thus, that is the end of the case of Marbury versus Madison, an all-time classic of Supreme Court law, the case where the Supreme Court denied themselves power, and in doing so, gave themselves power namely the power of judicial review, which I think is probably well implied by the third article of the Constitution. But, you know, the third article of the Constitution doesn't say it explicitly. And the Constitution, so the Supreme Court says they solve many, many problems at once. They solve the political problem by basically ruling for neither side, by saying, we don't have the authority to do this. You filed directly before us and we can't do it. So we deny ourselves the power to do that. We fix our immediate problem and we also grant ourselves the power of judicial review. So if the Constitution and the statutes conflict, the Constitution must win. So this remains as foundational a case as ever when it comes to Supreme Court jurisprudence, an all-time classic. And at least for the moment, that's the end of the coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you liked this latest video, please give it a like below and hit the join button. For 99 cents a month, you too can give a recurring membership that helps this channel grow and helps YouTube to recommend this channel to others. We really appreciate your continued financial support and all your love. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.